All right. Hello and welcome to Congregation Beth Shalom's uh, lunch study break. Today is Wednesday, July 7th, uh, and we have a special guest joining us here. So um, as people are still coming in here, I'm going to introduce Madison Margolin, who is an independent journalist uh, covering a wide variety of topics. And today's topic that uh, we're going to discuss here is Jews and psychedelics. So uh, I was tempted, Madison, to write no experience necessary uh, in the tagline, but I, I, I didn't do that. But we are going to have a real conversation, Madison. What I've been doing here, we started these lunch study breaks every Wednesday at noon uh, since COVID began. And it's a space for us to talk in depth, um, honestly and openly. Uh, and share. Uh, we're allowed to disagree with each other. We just have to do it politely. So this is a space we've had um, some politicians come, we've had rabbis come, we've had thinkers come, and we're glad to have you because this is a topic that I think uh, has been coming up. It's certainly in the news. I was just talking to somebody recently and said, oh, I saw this in the paper. Uh, and then I mentioned that, Madison, you were going to join us today. Uh, at synagogue and somebody said, oh, I did that already in the 60s. So uh, I do I do want to talk a, a little bit about that as well. So first, let me introduce Madison to all of you uh, and let you know who she is. Uh, so Madison is a California, New York based journalist who covers cannabis, psychedelics and Jewishness, uh, both Jewish culture and religion. Uh, in truthful jests, she likes to say she reports on Jews and drugs. She has a master's of science in journalism from Columbia, the Columbia J School, uh, where she learned magazine feature writing, investigative reporting, ethnic beat writing, and multimedia techniques uh, as well. She has a BA in rhetoric and cognitive linguistics from UC Berkeley. And she has also taken coursework in Judaism and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict at Bina, which is the secular yeshiva in South Tel Aviv. She works as an editor at Double Blind, which is a magazine she co-founded, which covers psychedelics and all that intersect with, uh, including social equity, environmental justice, science, policy, queer culture, and spirituality. She has a column with Rolling Stone about psychedelics and she got her start in journalism writing about cannabis for the Village Voice and Jewish culture for the forward. She's been in such places such as Vice, Playboy, Tablet, Times of Israel, High Times, Nylon, among others. And she is currently working on a long-term investigative story, which I would love to ask you about as we get closer towards the end here, on Heimish Psychedelia for the New York Times. So you're working on a piece on Heimish Psychedelia for the New York Times. In addition, she is also the co-founder of the Jewish Psychedelic Summit, which was had its first summit this past May. So it is uh, a real pleasure. Madison, I also know back from Brooklyn. Uh, so it is good to see you. Where are you located uh, right now? Where are you calling in from, Madison? Crown Heights. You are in Crown Heights. All right. So how how is Crown? Is it hot there at the moment? Really hot and muggy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't miss it at all. Uh, okay. So it is. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I see we have a number of people are joining us, and the topic today uh, is to discuss Jews and psychedelia, uh, and psychedelics. But before we get there, I'm curious. Uh, if you could share a little bit about your background, uh, you've written in Vice that you grew up raised by Jewish hippies, uh, and that your dad traveled to India in the 70s and spent time with Naeem Kar, I'm going to pronounce that wrong. Naeem Karoli Baba. Uh, who was the same guru who inspired Ram Das. So uh, tell us about growing up in this um, Jewish hippie environment. Uh, uh, as a kid and the impact uh, that that had on you and your career path? Yeah, so I grew up um, in the quote unquote satsang. It's sort of the Sanskrit term for Hevra, um, which are the community of people who spent time with Neem Karoli Baba, um, which you know they kind of would endearingly call Maharaji um, and Ram Das and that whole community. And so what I observed growing up was there were all of these Jewish people. They were all sort of my aunts and uncles, um, so to speak. And they had these Jewish names like Steve Baum and they'd go by Mohan or whatever their Hindu name was. And at the same time, um, 
you know, my mother is from Queens, so she's a very classic, like neurotic Jewish mother. My dad is this hippie who's going off to India um, and was also a criminal defense attorney um, specializing in marijuana defense. So he defended Timothy Leary. He ran for governor at one point um, to legalize weed. And so a little different, a little different from my upbringing <laughs> on Long Island. Yeah, just, so, just so we're clear there. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, yeah, that's so that's yeah. Tell me more. That's fascinating. No, how did that impact you? I mean, how did you understand your Jewish? Yeah, connection? so I, I was, you know, I was kind of surrounded by this really eclectic cast of characters my whole life. And, you know, the question I had was, especially as my parents kind of stuck with putting me through Hebrew school, which I'm kind of surprised they even did that in retrospect was me observing all of these Jewish people looking for spirituality everywhere other than Judaism. So in Hinduism, Buddhism, Rainbow Gathering, Burning Man, psychedelics, cannabis, whatever, just so long as it wasn't straight up Judaism. And I was still getting a Jewish education. And so that really was my question growing up, um, you know, was especially with texts like Be Here Now kind of as central to my upbringing as, you know, the Torah or something like that. Um, and then, you know, throughout journalism school, what, what happened was that I was um, assigned to the Hasidic uh, ethnic beat. I didn't, I didn't even have a choice in the matter. I was one of two Jews in the class and they made me report on the Hasidim in Williamsburg or Borough Park. And eventually I came to Crown Heights where it was much easier um, to report because Chabad loves to bring people in. So I was easy, easy target for them. But um, you know, essentially, I, I came across these communities who were singing and kind of getting to these ecstatic spiritual highs, um, you know, in community with drugs, through ecstatic Shabbases, through ayahuasca, through whatever it was. And it reminded me of the kirtans or like Hindu chanting events that I was familiar with from growing up. And so I saw all of these parallels between kind of like traditional, for lack of a better word, Heimish Hasidic Jewish practice and the, you know, and the traditions and, and vibe of, of my own personal upbringing. And so that's really kind of what set me on this path of exploring Judaism and psychedelics um, by kind of reconciling both my, my childhood and um, what I've learned along the way, kind of living in New York and Israel and places like that. Um, so, so you have uh, quite the portfolio here. So I, I have a number of your articles uh, and I'm going to ask you a few questions. And then, of course, as always, we're going to open up some questions. So this is, I, I think, uh, one piece that you had here. Was Moses tripping uh, when he saw the burning bush? Should you try? A growing number of Jews are using psychedelics to reach spiritual highs. And you might be surprised to learn that some Orthodox don't frown upon the practice. So, uh, so tell, I mean, so explain to those who aren't familiar with sort of this orthodox subculture of people who are using psychedelics uh, to experience, uh, uh, I guess, heightened moments. Um, what does that look like? Is it halachic? Uh, does it follow Jewish law? Are they doing it in secret? How does it manifest? Yeah, it's, it's all sorts of, it, it's all, all of the above. Um, so I was first introduced to it by a couple kids who were quote unquote OTD off the derech, meaning that they, um, you know, were like kind of negotiating their relationship to religion. They were kids who grew up Yiddish speaking in Williamsburg and are going to these side trans festivals every weekend of every summer in upstate New York, kind of taking endless amounts of drugs, listening to music on Shabbos, but also bringing like a, a beer, what's it called? Like, um, massive beer kegs full of like gefilte fish um, and kugel and all of that. So it's a really interesting combination. Um, so there's so there's that. There's definitely the people who are just kind of using it in like this escapist or exploratory mode. It sounds like um, a fish festival. The way you do it sort of sounds like a fish festival with some, you know, uh, uh, that, but it's more than that, right? It's, I think it's more than that. And I think people are really coming to acknowledge that there is a spiritual component. There also is a healing component. And there's also an, an escapist or like hedonistic component. And, you know, we're talking about a community of people who are so, I mean, for lack of a better way to put it, so traumatized, whether it's because the Holocaust remains a front and center part of the community's conversation, whether it's because there is a shadow side to Orthodox life specifically that a lot of people are dealing with, especially if they don't necessarily fit the mold of what's expected of them 
you know, growing up in Williamsburg. So there's that. And then there are people who are also like, rather than kind of kids who are exploring themselves, there are also moms and dads who are maybe trying to repair their relationships with each other through ayahuasca or that I have a friend who's a rabbi who goes around with a DMT vape pen um, to from communities in Long Island. Um, that, you know, again, there's people who are doing ayahuasca with like traditional Jewish songs or niguna. And, you know, the person who I know who's been doing that, you know, at one point he's had like mixed um, groups. Now he's doing it in gender segregated ways to accommodate people who are more religious. Um, so again, it's kind of making waves, not just in the group of people who are already kind of. What do the rabbis think? What do the Chabad, what do the Rabbanim think of this in, in those groups? Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I think on some level it depends their, um, depends the extent to which they're familiar with the culture. So cannabis, you know, there are so many people at this point who are even working in cannabis, especially in Chabad. So I don't think it's really an issue. Um, you know, of course you have still Rabbanim who like, uh, who, you know, see like a drug as a drug. And so there's meetings and stuff, especially, you know, in Long Island and other places about drug use in the community and overdoses and X, Y, and Z. And the ones who maybe are more nuanced and can hear that like, you know, I have a friend who who's a rabbi and he he's kind of lives between New York and Israel and he talks about how Ibogaine, which is a really intense kind of like 24 hours like a plant medicine psychedelic, um, which is known specifically to halt opioid uh, use disorder kind of like by interrupting the neuronal networks that cause addiction and dependence. He's talking about using that and setting up Jewish spaces for people to use Ibogaine if they also are struggling with, for instance, opioids. And so there's also a lot of that kind of drug use in the community, just as it's in every- There's a healing, sort of as a healing, uh, especially the healing of, you know, one of the things we've been talking a lot about in this space and at the congregation in general is the intergenerational transmission of trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm wondering um, if I can ask you sort of about, you know, your family and your father, and you, is there a connection to the Shoah uh, that, there? Is there? Is there, uh, something that he was seeking uh, that you have a understanding on now after sort of delving into this world? Yeah, I mean, my family was in America before the Holocaust, um, but my dad grew up during the Holocaust. He's almost 80. So when he was a little kid, the Holocaust was still happening. And he remembers thinking, and he's told me this because I think he honestly has a lot of internalized anti Semitism. It's like, what's wrong with us that they're trying to kill us? And for like a little kid to think that something is inherently wrong with him for being Jewish. And that's something that I've seen my dad just like try to shake off his whole life. And, you know, his relationship to trauma, like his, his brother died when he was 13 and then his father died when he was 19. And he said he went to shul every, you know, with his father, he had gone to shul every day um, during the period, you know, to say Kaddish, to the, during a year long period to say Kaddish. And so when his father died at 19, my dad went to shul alone every day, um, you know, for the same reason. And nobody at the shul kind of was nice to him or accepted or embraced him or made him feel welcome. And so his response was, well, like, screw this. Like, what is Judaism good for if not for like the one time when someone dies and I kind of need this community. And so that's really, I think that combined with already this self-hating Jewish thing, which I would say is informed a lot by trauma, um, is kind of what led him onto a more like Hindu path. Um, so yeah, yeah, the way the way you describe it, um, it sounds a lot like what I've experienced as a rabbi over the past fifteen years. People who have shown up at synagogues and for whatever reason uh, have been excluded or have not felt uh, welcomed inside, and they're looking for spiritual meaning. And because they haven't found it or they never thought to find it in a synagogue or in a shul they go off to festivals or to Peru or to other places to try to, I guess, appeal to that spiritual urge that we all have inside of us, that Avraham Avinu pointed us towards way back when. That is a part of who we are. We, we believe there is more. And if we don't feel that being responded to by our uh, religious establishments, we will, human beings will look for those elsewhere. Now, you started very recently uh, a very nice glossy magazine called Double Blind. And um, 
I see here how to microdose courses 50% off. It opens in July. So uh, for people uh, who are interested in that, and I do want to ask you about microdosing, but you right here, you know, sort of the the goal of this magazine, I think this is only a couple years old, right? So the goal of this magazine is to listen to everyone from indigenous communities who have preserved these medicines for millennia to the people in our society who most need healing. We're not speaking to the veteran tripper nor evangelizing to the anti-drug square. We're speaking to everyone who is curious about psychedelics. And you right here, which I thought was interesting. With an open mind and a commitment to fact checking, we provide nuance to the reporting on alternative healing modalities and mindfulness movements. Psychedelics aren't just about the 1960s cultural revolution or research renaissance that has followed. They're a jumping off point for exploring what it means to be well as individuals and as a collective. And so psychedelics are the quintessential example of what happens to a topic you write when it becomes so politicized that it can no longer be discussed in an open and fair way. So you should know that we've tried at Bes Shalom to create a space where people can talk about things, politicized or not, in an open and honest way. You write that despite the fact that in the 50s, psychedelics were already showing incredible promise as a mental health treatment, they were banned from science for decades due to their association with a culture of radical expression that threatened the status quo. So, and tell us a little bit about, I guess, what you have been, the goal of Double Blind. And I, I guess there's the, the heightened uh, experience that people go for, but I'm interested in the healing properties. I think that's what I'm hearing about a lot from people, you know, where they've undergone a trauma, PTSD, uh, and now whether it's through, and I don't know them, you'll have to explain the psychedelics, there is the power of healing. And it seems to me that you're, tapping into that and writing about that. So um, without getting into politics or without you know, pointing fingers, tell us a little bit about what the science has indicated in terms of the potential for healing trauma uh, with, these me with these plant medicines. Yeah, so you know, I think part of, the, when you asked about the goal of double blind, first of all, you know, when people think of psychedelic culture, they might think of 60s or hippies or Alex Gray visionary art or you know, the stereotypical stuff. And a lot of what we wanted to do was um, you know, reimagine the image of psychedelics and how they come across in culture and society. And so we have a joke at Double Blind, No Fractals, um, which essentially is like repairing high-end design, um, you know, in a glossy, uh, it's actually matte, but in a, in a, oh, print, mag in a print magazine, um, both online and in print twice a year. So we're, we're merging kind of like really high end aesthetic with investigative journalistic techniques. So nice kind of literary journalistic stories. Um, and that, that's kind of helping people again, look at psychedelics in a different way outside the stereotypes. What have um, you found? What's been the, um, before we get into the dangers, tell us some of the positives that you found. I mean, I think it's like a really a repackaging idea the same way, you know, Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind is the gift that you give to your grandmother if you want to get her interested in psychedelics or at least want to open up that conversation through a kind of a sober state approach. It's the same with double blind, maybe a little bit more millennial because, you know, that's what we are, or at least as the creators of the magazine. But, you know, to answer your question also about the science of psychedelics and what it's saying for PTSD and whatever else, if someone's interested in taking these medicines for trauma or addiction or anxiety or depression. And they're not necessarily trying to, you know, um, engage in this kind of like hippy dippy trippy uh, culture. Um, you know, double blind is there in that it's telling people what the science is, you know, depending on the articles you write, you, you find. It has a very one-on-one -on -one approach with a lot of the articles and it breaks it down. Why does MDMA, for instance, work so well for PTSD? You know, how do you microdose for anxiety? Um, can you get, is there, are there, what are the downsides to microdosing? What are the long-term effects? Kind of just answering all of these questions that people Google um, about psychedelics. Yeah, I think people have a lot of fears. I think people know bad stories uh, in which awful things happened when people have experimented with psychedelics. Um, and I guess how, you know, how, how do you report on this in a way that, I don't know, is safe, I guess is, yeah. How do you, how do you handle that as a journalist? Yeah, I mean, we're not promoting the use of psychedelics. Like I think we want to paint a very fair picture and that includes 
in, um, you know, the down, the shadow side of it. So, you know, when we have a story about LSD or whatever, um, you know, how to take mushrooms is like a very popular story. There's, you know, we have both features that are more nuanced and then we have SEO stuff that are more straightforward questions. Um, you know, part of it is really curate your set and setting, right? Like a trip can go south um, here, you know, here's how to get through a trip if it's challenging. Um, here's why it's so important to have, to pay attention to set and setting. There are people who, um, you know, if you have a latent psychological condition like um, schizophrenia, for instance, like why you should be cautious about that. Um, so we're not trying to shy away from, uh, from negative things about psychedelics. In fact, we just want to paint a fully honest picture because I think there's a danger to just being too positive about it. And then if something goes wrong, you know, people that, that kind of hasn't been acknowledged and it blows up in your face in a different way. Uh, yeah, um, ab absolutely. Um, uh, now, let me just move over here. So uh, we'll get into microdosing a little bit, which you wrote for Rolling Stone, a case for microdosing. Um, but you also started this. Uh, can you see this? The Jewish Psychedelic Summit. So this was this past May, and you were the co-founder of the Jewish Psychedelic Summit. The goal of which is what is the connection between psychedelics and Judaism? Join a global conversation. I just want to show everybody who is uh, who's watching this. Um, let's look at the presenters. So just look at the long list of presenters that Madison was able to put together. Journalists and rabbis and PhDs. Um, here's Rabbi Shefa Gold. Here's Roger Kamenetz. He gets Jordan. Here's Rabbi Zach Kamenetz. Here's Rabbi Michael Ziegler. So I mean, first of all, this goes on and on. So this doesn't, I, I scroll through this and it doesn't seem so fringe to me. Uh, and I'm wondering, is it fringe? I mean, what, what, you, so you started it. Uh, you said, I want to put together a psychedelic summit. What was the pitch letter like? And what was the response to the people that you brought together and how did it go? It went great. More than a thousand people signed up. In fact, more than 1100, maybe in close to 1500. Um, and we, that was with less than a month of promoting it. Um, so if, is it fringe? Like, Maybe it's, you know, it's not the reform Judaism movement, but like, um, I think it's much better than that, to be honest. And this is me coming out of like reform Hebrew schools, which I hated. Like, it's a wonder that I even have a connection to Judaism, to be honest. But like, that's, that's just me throwing shade right now. But I really think what's brewing is, um, is, is a movement that is at least on par with say the Jewish renewal movement. Um, so, you know, is that fringe? Like maybe, and I don't, you know, I don't think the mainstream Jewish world is necessarily hip to psychedelics, though we did get money from Schusterman to put on uh, this conference. Um, and I think also, you know, having the PhDs involved, having the rabbis involved, having people who have mainstream careers and um, reputability, you know, who, who have reputations in their given fields and then coming to a Jewish psychedelic summit and talking about trauma or talking about mysticism, but from an academic perspective and, you know, from people who have written books on this, I think kind of shows that there is, that, that there is kind of a psychedelic undercurrent to the mainstream. And what we're really doing is bringing it above board, you know, like, and again, there's a, one of my favorite books, um, Magic of the Ordinary by Gershon Winkler, uh, which looks, it's, you know, the tagline is rediscovering the shamanistic in Judaism. And it talks about how Judaism is an earth-based tradition. And you look at the way we shake a lulav and you look at the way that we follow a lunar calendar and all of Judaism follows the mainstream, you know, follows a lunar calendar. You know, that's not a niche thing um, to look at the moon and, and then determine like what's going on in the month. Um, granted, you know, in hippie culture, that's a big thing, but it shows that there are kind of elements that you would think are more hippie that really aren't. And so by doing that, I think there's a way to show that psychedelics themselves, especially as they become more mainstream in regular society, where you have, you know, FDA approval of psilocybin or magic mushrooms, FDA approval of MDMA, 
uh, decriminalization measures in Oakland and Denver in Washington, DC. The state of California has a full scale psychedelic decrim bill that's on the table. Um, this is becoming, this is like cannabis where, you know, where cannabis was maybe five to 10 years ago is where psychedelics are now. So it's becoming more and more mainstream. Um, I want to ask you one more question, which is, uh, and then I'm going to open it up for people to ask questions. Uh, and if you just want to raise your hand um, digitally, I will call on people. Uh, I want to know about COVID. I want to know how COVID has changed this a little bit. So yeah, no, you and I were in Brooklyn. We're, we're familiar with some of that crowd that existed pre-COVID. Um, and the desire of people to experience, you know, spiritual enlightenment and alternative and non-traditional ways. That's certainly a lot of what I did when I was in uh, Brooklyn, uh, just sort of trying to provide alternative avenues. And then COVID hit uh, and the world changed. Uh, and we were talking last week in preparation for this. And I said, well, what do you do if at like a ceremony where you're passing a cup? I mean, how do, how do you handle those things. I'm wondering how COVID uh, impacted uh, the psychedelic community. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that I have found uh, just as a conservative rabbi here in San Francisco is that a lot of millennials who otherwise would never think about shul uh, in light of COVID have come to realize, you know what, how I keep my house, who I live with, like my community, these things are actually, they matter. And I'm finding people you know, in their late twenties who are coming to me, who are dealing with their relationships and who want greater meaning. So from this end, I, from a traditional conservative and I've seen people looking for more meaning. I'm wondering if the, uh, I guess if there's been a boon uh, in your industry uh, in light of COVID or if I guess the, I guess the dynamics of the way that the virus spreads have made that impossible. Um. I think there's a lot of ways to answer this question. I think that COVID has been really divisive in regard to the way people are approaching it. There are some people who have been, of course, really COVID conscious, not going anywhere, Zoom shop is only, stuff like that. Then there are other people who kind of, you know, have this faith that it's just okay. And it's really, I think, for people outside the community, really hard to fathom even, you know, we're talking, especially in Brooklyn, we're talking about communities that were hit really, really, really hard by COVID. And these are the same people who are doing 20 person Shabbos dinners in the middle of the pandemic, no masks, no, like no regard for COVID whatsoever. And I asked somebody, um, his, his name is Isaac Schoenfeld. I was, you know, actually when I was reporting this story for the New York Times on Heimish Psychedelia, they put the story on hold because the only thing the Times could say about Hasidim was COVID related. So talk about a pigeonhole that they created um, <laughs> and perpetuated. Um, but I asked this, this person, Isaac, who is a kind of a longstanding figure in the community. He runs a Thursday night meetup called Cholent, which brings together all sorts of fringy people from the Hasidic world. And I said, like, what's with this? Like, why, what, what's with this sort of like disregard for COVID? And he said, if the community survives the pandemic in body, but not in soul, there's no reason to survive in body. And I, you know, I don't know, I asked another friend who's a rabbi what he thought of that idea. And he said, well, there's nothing in Judaism that says you shouldn't just like at least just take care of your body and protect your health and whatever. But I, I do understand that the community that especially the Orthodox Jews who are so hell bent on preservation you know, get, well, does it lend itself to mystical thinking? I mean, do, if I, I'm take, if I'm taking this DMT or whatever the substance is, then I am protected by the angels and the demons that I will become. I mean, I, do, I mean, is that a, a problem? Yeah, I think you know what I think it's impossible to rationalize with somebody who doesn't actually have a muna or faith. And it's you know, it's like this the ultimate irony, right? Like faith is beyond rationality. But part of the rash of the reasoning and the rationality of certain communities, and not not just from Jews, but also across the board of like the hippie kind of conspirituality people who think the whole thing is a hoax and this and that, is this like part of their reasoning includes just this faith that it's going to be okay. And I, I'm not saying that I agree or disagree. I'm just trying to like understand where people are coming from. 
Um, and Shaul Megid, I don't know, he's kind sure, of like a well known, yeah, uh, well known writer, wrote a story for Tablet about magical thinking and COVID. Um, and just, it's, it was an amazing story, very, very heady, but like really breaks it down as to like why we really shouldn't necessarily be judging these communities, even if it seems crazy. So that's kind of where the Jewish- That'll be next week's, that'll be next week's article, everybody here. My regulars, we'll do that. <laughs> we'll do the Uma Gid's article next week. That sounds yeah. great. Yeah, he's great, he's great. Um, yeah, and then in the psychedelic space, you have, again, people who think the whole thing is like, I don't know, I'm, I'm actually, I've been surprised to see who's anti this and who's pro that within the sort of hippie spaces and within communities where I've um, thought people would kind of have opposite opinions to what I've actually seen them dispel on Facebook. Yeah, I guess that just means that the psychedelic community is more of a cross section of the population. It's just a, a pure cross section of the population. All right, let me open it up. Anyone have any uh, questions? I have a lot more questions here, but let's, uh, let's start with Lisa. Hi, Madison. This is really fascinating. I'm wondering, you've expressed some astonishment that you have been more in the Jewish space personally than your upbringing would have made you do. And I'm just wondering if your connection with the Hasidic world or what, how do you ration, how did that happen to you? I, I, I have nieces who are probably your age who went to Jewish day school and they're really into 90 day meditation retreats and so I'm just trying to learn from you. Yeah, I mean, I was always really into Judaism. Like, I think that's just me. Like, I remember like in fourth grade, I impersonated Anne Frank for a book report and read a lot of Holocaust literature and was all, even when I, my grandmother is from Williamsburg. And so when I was a kid, we would go to South Williamsburg and like get Rugelach. And like, it was always just part of like, where I come from especially having my mother have all these New York roots um but I think you know because I grew up with this like Hindu thing when I was reporting on the Jewish world and meeting people who were singing and getting and doing community in a very very similar way that I grew up with and observed with my parents friends I said oh there's just all these parallels a kumsitz a kirtan it's kind of the same thing um, and I, again, I met, it wasn't like I was hanging out necessarily with people who are like stark black hat, whatever, like the mm -hmm. friends who I have in these communities are fringy and it's sort of this meeting in the middle of, um, Ram Dass told me a story once he was in Jerusalem and these two black hat kids came up to him and they're like, Ram Dass, it's you. Uh, we read B here now and we got really into acid and then we got religious. And so, you know, there, I think psychedelics is really the middle point, whether it's someone who is coming from a religious background and kind of experimenting and exploring themselves and maybe not as observant, but still kind of has the culture or someone who's coming from a secular background who discovers psychedelics and gets into spirituality and religion, um, but they meet at this middle point. And so I think that's, it's that middle point that has allowed me to really stay connected to all corners of the Jewish world. Amen. Thank you. Uh, is there was there truth to this story that they found you know cannabis residue you know back in the temple area? Did you cover that? Is there like is there an ancient source that I, I saw that was all over my Facebook page? Is there truth yeah. to that? Yeah, yeah, they found cannabis residue at this like Tel Arad shrine, um, and there's you know beyond that, hemp is mentioned in like the Shulchan Aruch and like. People say that cannabisum or cannabis is a part of like the holy mm -hmm. anointing oil and the incense. And, and it's just, it's all over the place kind of, if you really know where to look. All right, uh, Judah. Hi, Madison. I'm just kind of curious that most of the, well, the most hippy dippy Orthodox Jews I know are <laughs> breast lovers. And I'm just uh, curious as to their involvement do you know about, you know, yeah. strong involvement in psychedelics or Loto? Yeah, I, uh, I, I love Breslov, first of all. <laughs> I have some friends who are Nanach, 
Um, I mean, look at Uman, like, you know, for those of you in the audience who don't know, it's like um, basically the breast of the breast of go to the, the Rebbe's grave in Uman every Rosh Hashanah. And it's like this massive festival and people are taking psychedelics and listening to trance. And like, you know, I've had some breast, when I've interviewed people, I've had some breast lovers tell me like, I've had my psychedelic experiences, but now I'm kind of on the path and the best way is not without a shortcut. But keep in mind that this, the, especially Nanach is a movement that is by and large Baal Shuva. And so a lot of the people who are into that, which I think also is interesting that it's most, that it's a major, a plurality Sephardic Jews, which you don't necessarily see in a lot of Hasidic movements, um, are people who've had psychedelic experiences in India after the army or, you know, wherever. And so, and it's through that kind of like psychedelic entropy that brings them to Breslov. Um, and it all goes together quite nicely. And again, Uman is an example of psychedelic Judaism, probably at its peak. Uh, Meryl. Well, thank you for bringing this very interesting topic. Yeah. And, um, we need to open our minds and our hearts. Now, we were hippies, but pseudo hippies. We never mm -hmm. did drugs. Never. That's not pseudo. He said it's not so. Anyway, we didn't do drugs and we knew people who did and they had bad experiences. Only one or two out of all the ones that we knew had good experiences. So I do think that there's a lot of care that needs to be taken as one delves into this. I also wanted to say that once I got to Jewish Renewal in the late 90s, I trained with Gershon Winkler. I've trained with Shefa Gold. These people I respect because they are impeccable with the knowledge that goes behind whatever experimentation they would do. And I want to go on to say, I still haven't done drugs, but I've done holotropic breathing. I've done ecstatic dance. I've done all kinds of other meditative techniques that can get me to that possibly same level. And that's why I don't have depression. And believe me, I could because we've had suicide in the family. And that's why I'm interested very much in you know exploring further how this can be helpful. Uh, finally, I don't want to lose my train of thought. So what happens when you get old brain freeze without the drugs? <laughs> I apologize. There was something else. It was pertinent to the uh, conversation. Well, thank you. I want to to somebody else. We'll come back. Thank okay. you, Shami. <laughs> thank you, Shami. That's my mother-in-law. Uh, uh, that is my mother-in-law and my kids call her Shami uh, because she is not a mom mom. She's a shaman mom. Uh, That's my other thing. That's what I need to ask you about. I want to know about microdosing extremely pure quality cacao to which I have a connection to in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, well, first of all, I want to thank you for bringing up the point that you actually don't need the drugs. Um, and yeah. yeah, that's kind of like what Ram Dass eventually figured out though he never actually stopped tripping if you thought he did, that was a, a legend um, or a myth or whatever. But, you know, really like, the, I mean, this is what these Hasidim were saying to me, this breast liver guy, he said like you, it's a shortcut and um, it's not about the drugs. The drug, like my dad says like the drugs will open the door but it's not the path in and of itself, right? you still have to get there. And so if you have ways of getting there through ecstatic dance or whatever, right? Um, as for microdosing cacao, I, I mean, definitely it's a great, powerful plant medicine. I don't know, I don't know that much about like microdose. I mean, it depends what a microdose of cacao really is, right? Like, is that that's like my that's like my chocolate coffee from Starbucks. No, it's not. I think that's when I find out more about it, I'm going to get to both you because I'm really <laughs> investigating. Thank this. you. Investigating. Thank you, Shami. Thank you, Shami. We love we love Shami. Um, and I love Shami's point, uh, which is very important, which is that sometimes the drugs can become you, uh, a vodazara. It can become an idol, uh, mm -hmm. and you can think that it's only by turning the drug or the whatever it might be into its own to reify that. And then you become worshiping that. And, you know, I've heard, you know, Madison Icaros, Icaros to the drug itself or songs that are sung to marijuana or to whatever it is. I mean, to a certain extent, that is a little bit of Avodah Zarah. Uh, and I, I really love the connection that Shami brought, which was just to say, hey, you know, it can be a tool. 
uh, but there are also ways to do it uh, by creating community and space where we can experience that uplift together. Uh, Adam Lowy. Hi. Uh, hi, Madison. Thanks so much for uh, being a part of this conversation. Thanks, Rabbi, for bringing in Madison. Uh, Madison, I, I'm going to just say that, you know, I've, <clears throat> I've, I've been around the block a few times. Uh, I've been with people who've been around the block a few times. And I, one thing that I, I feel like hasn't been mentioned yet uh, and that I feel like I've heard uh, over my years um, with people who've explored psychedelics is, uh, is this notion of kind of getting closer to God. Uh, and I wanted to ask uh, you about that because I, I don't feel like that word has been mentioned yet. Uh, in this conversation. And uh, I feel like, um, you know, psychedelics have that uh, potential to, to uh, support your efforts. Uh, and whether you expect it or not, uh, sometimes you all of a sudden realize that this is God, this is my understanding, and this is what I've been trying to kind of understand for a long time. So uh, I'm just curious, how does, how does God fall into this um, as you were use the word spirituality and, uh, and kind of, uh, opening up to, to new paths, um, where's God fallen in, into all this in, in your mind? For me personally, like front and center, um, you know, and it's a weird thing that like, not everyone talks about God and I appreciate you re realizing that I, we didn't even use this word yet. Um, you know, I think, you know, again, it kind of goes back to the idea that like, psychedelics will show you the way, but they're not the way in and of themselves. So psychedelics will unlock certain neuro pathways that enable you to maybe experience God in a different way than you do in your sort of mundane thinking. Um, but really, I think it's the memory of that. Like when you're under a psychedelic, when you're under the influence of a psychedelic, the idea is to then like integrate that feeling of God back into your regular life so you don't need psychedelics all the time to remember that like god is real or whatever the case may be and again you know like this interview that i did with this this nana breslov guy he said to me he's he had all the psychedelic experiences but at a certain point he dropped it because it was just not the real thing it's just again it's just the door to the real to potentially the real thing but maybe not even that and so um you know, what I'm really curious about is Judaism as a container for altered states and as through Jewish ritual and Jewish practice and following the calendar and whatever it might be, that, that is sort of the container that engender, that can allow you to more easily, um, or that more easily enables uh, communion with, with God. So, so you, yeah. No, no, you go, you continue. I no, don't just just that like Shabbos, like for instance, if you're, if you're really like putting yourself in like Shabbos mode, right? Like if you, whether or not you keep Shabbos, but really tapping into the energy of Shabbat, like that, that's like an all, that's like a different zone. Really. I, I think it is. And I think the same for other Chagin too. And like the way that Judaism can be practiced is like the, you know, the reason you're not going to do Maksa on Shabbos, for instance, is like, if, if I'm like in a spiritual altered state, like I don't want to think about spending money or driving a car or whatever. Like, I just want to be here now, right? Like be present and like be fully aware in, in the experience. And through that, you can really experience God with a different nuance and in a different way than your ordinary life. That has nothing to do with psychedelics, right? So Shabbos, I think in itself is an altered state. If I'm going to trip, I prefer to do it on Shabbat because I'm already kind of in a better mental zone. But that's what I'm saying is like Judaism itself is an expression of in a container for altered states with or without the substances. Well, yeah. I mean, how do we welcome in the Shabbat? We light a candle and we drink some wine. We, we, the reason that we have Kiddush wine is because we want to heighten the joy and the simcha of the Shabbos. I mean, that's that's the end of when we let out the Shabbat and the Havdalah, we have more wine, more light, and we have incense. We have things that smell there. It's definitely about creating a different uh, state for that for that day. Kayla, Kayla, I see you're you're calling in. Do you have a question? It's actually David. Great All right, David. Yeah, go right ahead. New York, where we can confirm it's very hot. Um, <laughs> quick question, and thank you for doing this. Amazing. Quick question: Is there, and this is a yes or no? I'm not asking for particulars. Is there a camera of these um, 
Jewish, you know, uh, Jewish medicine, you know, the people that, that right. are practitioners in this medicine that have the Jewish lens to it, is, does that exist a sever of those people or is that not a thing? Are, are you asking, are there people who facilitate medicine experiences who do so through a Jewish framework? Correct. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, and I think that, uh, David, your question goes to uh, the question that came in in the chat, which was, and I think actually goes to your last point, why not just do it with science? Why not go, why not, if you if it helps to open the door, why not go into a medical, so we have this sort of, uh, these two paths. You can either choose this sort of ancient, ritualized structures, ceremonial, connection to God to experience these psychedelics, or you can go to your doctor uh, who can uh, distribute it scientifically and therapeutically. Um, is there a difference between the two? Madison? Is Yeah, I mean, I think like, sorry, I thought you were asking David. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I look, I think um, this, the spiritual and the medical are not so distinct from one another in, in that like people talk about medicine as this like dry, sterile, like whatever thing. And um, that's, you know, you can have moments of like joy or transcendence in a medical context. And at the same time in the ceremonial context, the point of that, or part of the point is not just like a relationship to, to God, but also like healing. So one thing that they're finding in these clinical trials, for instance, is a lot of patients uh, who are doing psilocybin are, um, which is the main con uh, psychoactive compound in magic mushrooms, are experiencing this quote unquote mystical experience, which is a scientific term with seven criteria or so that have been defined by scientists, including a sense of oneness, a deeply felt positive mood, this like ineffability or inability to describe the experience with words, um, a sense of ultimate reality, um, whatever. And what they're finding is that the magnitude to which someone experience, has this mystical experience often correlates with the magnitude to which they're healing from whatever condition they're in the study mm -hmm. for. So I think there's like a really strong relationship between wellness, uh, spiritual, emotional, physical wellness, um, and spirituality altogether, I guess. Yeah, not, not mutually uh, exclusive. Uh, um, Alex writes, unfortunately, I believe the funding for this type of research is limited only from private universities and labs. Is that where we are at the moment? Yeah, no? I mean, this research, I mean, there's things like the Beckley Foundation. Yeah, I guess these are sort of like private funding things. Um, but this is happening at Johns Hopkins at NYU. Um, MAPS, which is a nonprofit, is doing their own research with MDMA, uh, Imperial College London. So again, these are mostly universities. Um, and there are, um, thank you, Kayla. Um, <laughs> there, there, um, there are uh, different funds that, again, are promoting this research. Uh, Jeff. Yes, hi, Madison. Two things. Um, firstly, Harvard Divinity School just did a year-long series of presentations, you're aware. Mm -hmm. Okay. A presentations. A presentation. No, you're nodding, so I, th I don't want to tell you if you already you've already know about. No, but go on, go. I'm like nodding, like and keep going. Oh, oh all yeah. right. Harvard uh, Divinity School just did a year long series of presentations of about um, uh, entheogens, religion, and psychedelics. Uh, uh, one of them was um, uh, Mirror Rescue, the the, um, the young man in New York who has been investigating the the origins of the Eucharist in um, sacred mushrooms, and. Um, uh, anyway, they're all they're all on um, the Diff School website. They record all of their presentations. Um, it's primary. It's actually the center for the study of world religions because there's a lot there. But if you go and you focus in on that, you should find them. The uh, the thing I wanted to ask, and I guess you just answered it, is are these substances available? Um, I, I've I have a certain amount of frustration with these these dialogues that have been taking place over the last several years. There's a lot of talk about the origins of, uh, of religion in, um, in entheogens and, uh, and what the future, what their future use might be. Um, 
but they're not, I don't see them as being available to most people, you know, and, and on occasion when they are available, they're not very much available outside of New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. I live in Boston. We do have a, an entheogen group here, and it's just basically a lot of undisciplined young people who are experimenting and, you know, just kind of futzing around. And I, I, are you aware of, I mean, if an old guy like me wanted to try this at, under responsible guidance, is I, I don't, is there any avenue? Because I'm not finding any. I know one person in the Boston area specifically who um, might be able to point you in that direction. Um, so yeah, I think you're right. Does right. your magazine does? I mean, does your magazine have contacts and connections for communities? Yeah, we do. We, well, we have this like Psychedelics 101 course, which sort of among other things includes like an entire list of integration coaches and communities. Um, all over the place. Um, but again, like, you know, I think one way to do it is to kind of connect with the local psychedelic society and then ask from there if there are any guides or therapists or whatever. Um, you know, when you asked about the pandemic before, one thing that I forgot to mention was that that was the, the start of the pandemic around like April, we launched a course on how to grow your own mushrooms. Um, the reason for that being that it's a great thing to do at home um, and people want to be more in control of their medicine and their food. And, and if you live in a place like Boston or wherever, you can order psilocybin spores and grow your own. And, and it's not very hard. Um, so there's, there's that. But I, you know, I do really want to say that like the laws are changing. Like in, um, uh, and for, in Somerville, Massachusetts, for instance, they just yeah. decriminalized all naturally occurring psychedelics. Um, oh, all right. And so I'm sure, in you know, they're the folks in Somerville. Just go to Tufts, Jeff. Just head over to yeah. Tufts. <laughs> yeah, like it's it's changing, and I think that's going to change the way people talk about psychedelics and the access points as well. So, but you're, I mean, you're right that like. I mean, I, I'm not sure really what the question is, is where can you find good stuff in Boston? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, well, no, I think, no, I think we, I think you might've answered that question. Ben, did you want to come in here and did you have something you're, okay. So we have the executive director of the Masor T Foundation who is here, Gideon uh, Aronoff. Gideon, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, do you have a question? No, I do. Um, so first of all, thank you, Madison, for all the stuff you're doing. A new subscriber to Double Blind and was fortunate to learn about the summit just a week before. I'm, 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 I'm blessed to know that Masorti uh, Judaism is following Madison and Double Blind. <laughs> um, I'm doing it with my regular kippah rather than my Masorti kippah, but uh, um, but I actually, it, I'm interested in very much in that theme, which is I was really blown away by the summit. I was blown away by the scope of people that you had from people who felt, uh, you know, priestesses type people. And you know, doctors and psychiatrists and all of that. And um, I'm curious about the response of so-called mainstream Jewish organizational life. I think it's fantastic that Beth Shalom is putting this issue so uh, front and center on the table. And, but has there been an, uh, this kind of openness to looking at these issues um, from other synagogues or other entities like that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, here's one example, right? And I know that Rabbi Zach Kamenetz did a thing with another conservative shul. Um, you know, I just recently spoke with a friend who's not an Orthodox and she lives in Teaneck. And she was telling me that her shul would love to kind of do a thing like this with me. Um, and, you know, she's she's a mom, right? She's like 55. Again, this is this is something that when presented in the right way doesn't necessarily come off as crazy and niche. And I think that's really like the um, the Kiddush here a little bit in regards to how people are, you know, considering psychedelics. You know, I've had a few people even since the psychedelic conference or summit rather um, reach out to me. They're like baby boomers who want to do psychedelic Shabbatones. <laughs> And I never considered guiding anybody. And I said, I'm not a guide, I'm a journalist. <laughs> um, but I, I'm having a lot of people ask me this. And it's just kind of astounding that actually more people who are asking me are boomers who are returning to it or never tried it before. Um, who, you know, what I think is really cool are grounded enough in themselves. They're not some like 25 year old who could lose their mind, but someone who already has the life experience that really is 
um, I think a positive weight um, when approaching a psychedelic experience that could like, you know, that's, that's a, a block of people who have economic power, who have political power, who have all sorts of ways of operating in society that I think is really valuable. And I'm excited that they're coming to me asking about psychedelics. Can I ask one, one other quick question? Yeah, sure. uh, one thing that was very fascinating for me with my focus on Israel is the way that uh, the, I don't, I don't exactly remember what your role it was, but the Israeli-Palestinian trauma and psychedelics project. Can you tell, talk, talk a little bit about your Bina, your studied Bina? Oh, is, is referring to Bina? Yeah. Um, I don't, you had talked about a group of a joint Israeli-Palestinian yeah. group. Is that yes, yes, yes. Group? There's, so there is a study, an anecdotal study going on right now that's looking at Israelis and Palestinians who are sitting in ayahuasca ceremony together. Um, and so mm -hmm. that is being conducted by an, a Palestinian peace activist named Antoine Saka and an Israeli researcher, uh, Leo Roseman, who works at Imperial College London. And then Natalie Ginsberg from MAPS is kind of like also partially overseeing it. I've written about this study before. I also wrote a story a couple of years ago for Playboy about how addressing trauma is part and parcel to um, the peace in general uh, in the region. Um, and I think the reason for that is when you're voting out of this, ex when you're making political decisions out of an existential threat and fear of the other and inability to empathize and the way trauma works in the brain on so many different levels, especially, you know, between the ages of like 17 and 25, um, which is prime, prime age for whether you're in the military or you're kind of a, um, an excitable Palestinian activist or whatever it might be, these, you know, that's kind of a really important age group. Um, that's real, but yeah, like addressing, nipping trauma in the bud and it, it's going to happen over several generations it's not just going to happen immediately and it's not just psychedelic medicine that's going to hopefully help because i don't think everyone's going to have access to it but taking kind of like that ethos and consciousness and um methodology from psychedelic uh psychedelic healing and somatic therapy work and trying to use that as a lens um through which to kind of approach the conflict oh. I didn't know about that. Thank you for the question, Gideon. That's a, a fascinating area. Um, yeah, and for me, um, the trauma aspect, the healing of trauma uh, is so, so on the forefront uh, in so much of my work as a rabbi, uh, grappling with trauma from generation to generation. Um, you know, I think about my parents, uh, who I can promise my in-laws, my parents have also never touched a drug. <laughs> That's, if there's anything I'm sure of, it's that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but you know, maybe there is still potential for growth, um, uh, even for people in their seventies or in their eighties. Um, so, uh, I really like that, um, as a potential approach. And I love how you framed it. It's like people who understand who they are, mm -hmm. aren't vulnerable, who've lived the life, um, uh, but yet still want more and want further exploration. This is the potential perhaps, mm -hmm. perhaps for that. Ben. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Um, hi. Uh, so you, people keep talking about how they've never touched drugs. I'm pretty sure that they have. They just probably haven't touched the drugs that might be criminalized, mm -hmm. right? And to that point, um, you know, our, 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 our drug codes come down, some is kind of feel like a kind of kashrut, right? There are some that are good and some that are bad, right? And some that are you know, okay, and some that aren't okay, um, uh, in, in, and sometimes they feel feels arbitrary in a way that kashrut sometimes feels arbitrary. So I was just wanted to ask if double blind has kind of made common cause with other um, uh, decriminalization uh, activities around not just psychedelics but all kinds of drugs um, that you know people take for for all kinds of reasons and that. Um, you know, because I'm assuming behind your double blind is must be an assumption that this stuff is okay, to, you know, in some yeah, respect, I, right? I, and that we should be able to take responsibility for what we put in our bodies. I really appreciate that you're asking this question. Um, I wrote a story about a year ago on the psychedelic exceptionalism debate, um, 
in which, you know, this idea that like psychedelics and cannabis are good drugs and heroin and cocaine and meth and all of that are bad drugs. And it basically perpetuates the stigma. Um, you know, you probably saw in Oregon that they decriminalized all drugs or at least personal possession of that. And I think that's really important to like have this as part of the same conversation. Um, and so I get really frustrated, for instance, when people talk about plant medicine all the time to the exclusion of MDMA or LSD, let alone, again, any of these other drugs. And so I think that part of psychedelic uh, legislative reform should include uh, just drug reform in general. And again, the reason for that is perpetuating stigma of one class of drug users is not going to be good for anybody. Um, and I think also the psychedelic community can sort of help uplift other drug users. So for it, or, or, or and vice versa. So for instance, in places like Vancouver, you have a uh, safe injection sites for heroin. And um, that's kind of like a safe zone, right, for opioid users. And the same way if you go to a festival like Burning Man and there's a psychedelic safe zone called a Zendo tent and people are going there and get, getting through their bad trips, it's very much the same idea, having brick and mortar physical spaces where people can go and have a drug experience in a safe way. Um, Carl Hart, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he's a neuroscientist at Columbia University um, and just wrote a book called Drug Use for Grownups. And he is a really hip neuroscientist writer. He's out of the closet uh, heroin user casually. Um, and he totally has his life together and he's he's open about how, how he smokes weed and sometimes he does heroin because that's how he likes to relax the same way someone might wanna have a beer after work. And he has kids and he's, you know, again, he's on university staff and he talks about psychedelics. And, and again, there's all sorts of He's also a person of color, which I think is just completely brave um, of him to to be talking like this. But you know, again, it's it's I don't you know I, I kind of lost my train of thought there. But it's an important conversation to have. And then I think also Michael Pollan just came out with this new book. Um, this is your brain on plants or something like that. You know, and let's let's talk about that everyone is on a drug called caffeine um, and coffee and cigarettes and alcohol and. Um, whatever a cocktail of pharmaceuticals that people are taking. Um, again, it's like, it's like when I drive around Madison, my wife is like, what, what are people on when they drive around San Francisco? That's what she asks me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's all it's all drugs or it's all medicines. It's all whatever you want to call it. I had a, a professor at Berkeley, David Presti, who used to say that the difference between a drug and a medicine is the dose. So that's kind of my approach. Thank you, Madison. Thank you for spending our lunch hour break with us. Um, I feel like I got quite an education uh, in this, but we've only really scratched the surface. Um, so, but I, you know, thank you all. This is, you know, this lunch hour has become very special for this group in the past year because we've talked about things that you probably would be afraid to talk about. Uh, everybody's nodding their heads. They, uh, and yet we've been able to do it uh, in a space that is open-minded, um, that can ask hard questions and that we can still come together uh, as a community. So thank you uh, for bringing uh, this to us. Um, Brett, I see you. Brett, it's good to see you. Uh, nice to, that's my cousin Brett is also here. So thank you uh, everyone for coming. And if you have any more questions, Madison, they can reach you where? How can people reach you? Um, Madison at doubleblindmag.com or you can find me on uh, Twitter, Margolin, Madison, um, or Facebook, Madison Margolin, or you know any sort of platform. If you if you Google if you go to my website, MadisonMargolin.com, you'll you'll find it all. All right. Well, thank you again, Madison, and um, send me the Shoal Magid article. Uh, that way, this group can discuss that uh, a week from today. Well, I will uh, send it to you right now. All right. Okay. All right. Nice take care, everybody. It's nice meeting everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.